thank you all for coming out. This is a, an occasion to uh, uh, have a, a program that's uh, following in <clears throat> some general sense in the work of my father to measure carbon dioxide and set off the discussions about climate change. Uh, we have one of these lectures as part of the perspectives as oceanography once a year. Um, we, it's an occasion to bring in a, an important speaker from somewhere to educate us about how this interesting and dynamic topic is, <clears throat> is changing and, and what we're learning. Um, I, uh, there's a, a committee that helps pick the speaker, and they've done a great job in recent years of, of taking some of that burden or consider a lot of that burden off of uh, the Keeling family, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and they came back this year with several names for my mother and I to look at. And it took me a while to realize that I actually knew one of these people very well. And that was our speaker, Beth Holland. So let me tell you a little bit about our background. <clears throat> um, I was a postdoc at the National Center for Atmospheric Research starting around 1990. Uh, I was starting to do atmospheric measurements myself. And I was... Uh, placed in an organizational unit there, a, a research group that was uh, doing terrestrial ecology, looking at gases that are coming from plants in and out of the atmosphere. So it still belonged in an atmospheric institution. And there, among meeting many people, I met Beth Holland. She's a, an expert on the nitrogen cycle, so a really a solid grounding in ecology. But what I was interesting to see when I, this name came back is, what's she doing in Fiji? Now this brings up another aspect of uh, the selection process, that it was uh, my view and the view of several others that it was time in this series to hear from someone who was actually working on not the mitigation side of the problem or not defining the science that tells us this is a problem, but actually has some firsthand experience with what people out there in the real world are experiencing in the way of climate change and how they're dealing with this. So I'm very excited to hear about how the Pacific Islands are facing the stark reality of sea level rise and the other challenges they face. So um, let me also say that you know this is a gathering of a lot of familiar faces to me. There are friends of my father's here. There's friends of the family here. There's friends of the community here. There's people who care about the science here. So it's really heartwarming to see familiar faces like friends of my father's, uh, but the Lamperts right there in the front row. They go all the way back to his uh, high school years. So there's some really amazing people here. So I hope they get a chance to mingle and, and, and meet some of the crowd here. So at this point, I'm very excited and very happy to introduce my dear friend, Beth Holland. Thank you, Ralph, and thank you all. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight. I need to say Fiji style, Nisan Bulubinaka, because that's how we're supposed to greet people in the formal way. Bula is the short form, but in the COP presidency, because Fiji is still the president of the UNFCCC Conference of Parties, it's meant to convey inclusiveness, friendliness, and solidarity. And a lot of what Fiji diplomacy is about is that inclusiveness, friendliness, and solidarity. And what I get to talk about tonight is a lot of what Fiji diplomacy and what Pacific diplomacy has brought us. But I am, this is my first visit to Scripps. I've meant to come for decades, <laughs> but I finally made it. I had to go to Fiji first. But um, with regard to this lecture, you've heard the phrase standing on the shoulders of giants, right? In science, we mean that we're standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. And for me, Charles David Keeling is one of those giants. He's laid the foundation of the field that we now pursue. And I couldn't be more honored to be here at this lecture. But it's also great fun for me to go back to a time in 1990 
How could I be that old? How could Ralph be that old? <laughs> to be, to where I learned so much from Ralph and to come back and share what I've learned in Fiji. So um, we, I work at the University of the South Pacific and this year I'm a bit obligated to use this 50th anniversary um, template and we're now 50 years old. In the decolonization of the Pacific, they wanted to build some capacity to, to deal with the Pacific and for the Pacific leaders to come forward. So our university is responsible for teaching those Pacific leaders. And I want to just take a moment, if you don't mind, and um, read the names of the countries I work in. I'm not capable with a bit of jet lag of remembering all 16 countries that we work in. And it also forms a way of me managing anxiety because I read the names and it's like poetry for me. So we work in the Cook Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia. <laughs> Fiji, Kiribati. Nauru, Niue, Palau, Papua New Guinea, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste, Tokelau, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. So we're one of three regional universities in the world. The other one is in the Caribbean, the University of the West Indies, and then we also have the European Union University. And so this is a great privilege for us because that means that I don't think about a single city or a single state or a single country. I get to serve all 16 of those countries. And those 16 countries have been tremendous leaders in the negotiations on climate change and tremendous leaders in thinking of themselves as stewards of our, our ocean. Our leaders are a bit like the El Nino that's described here because the red is, the, is ocean temperature um, the, and the warm ocean waters and the blue is the cool ocean waters. And you can see our islands coming up. And you can see that what happens in our part of the Pacific in the Western Pacific, in the Equatorial Pacific, influences what happens here in San Diego. It influences what happens all around the world. And so our Pacific leaders are like that. They come from our islands, but they influence what happens all over the world. And as you go to my having read all of the names of the countries that I, we work in, these EEZs that are shown in the light colors here are huge. So the EEZ of Kiribati contains the, all of the United States or all of Europe. So these are really vast ocean spaces. And the Pacific countries that I just read out are called the PSIDS countries. So the Pacific Small Island Developing States in UN speak. They're members of the Alliance for Small Island States that leads in the climate change negotiations. But our leaders like to think of us as the boss. <laughs> the stewards of the Pacific, the big ocean states, because our big ocean, because our ocean determines everything that we do and infuses the fluidity of our cultures. But I'm a little bit of a misfit because, as Ralph said, I'm a terrestrial ecologist, but I grew up in the desert. I grew up in Georgia O'Keeffe land, in the Pedernal, the square top mountain that Georgia O'Keeffe painted over and over again because if she painted it enough times, God would make it hers. And so for me, I'm a little bit like Georgia O'Keeffe with a pedernal, but I'm 
Elizabeth Holland with the Pacific Ocean. So I'm not a painter, but I get to speak about it, and it gets to be part of who I am and what I do. So all together, we get to work with that alliance of small island states. The small island states, the boss, cover more than 10% of the world's oceans. And we're also responsible for establishing many of the large marine protected areas and descendant from Pacific culture. Protection of our ocean has been part of Pacific culture since we had inhabitants on our islands. And I need to apologize to the Pacific Islanders here because while I wasn't born in the Pacific Islands, I feel very much like I am of the Pacific Islands, but I don't want to come across as yet another colonizing force that we've had so often in the Pacific and why the 50 years of our university is so important for the Pacific because we need that sort of connectedness and partnership that allow us to have the strong voyaging history that defines the Pacific. Because we need to voyage together as partners with the Pacific voices fully on board. So as we went in to the Paris negotiations, the Pacific had, and our Pacific leaders, had established no fewer than 10 declarations in support of climate change. One of those declarations was the Suva Declaration. And the Suva Declaration of those 10 declarations was the strongest in terms of what it said about science. So, I'll just read the first piece of the, the declaration because these words that come from the Suva Declaration and from the Paris Agreement have such big language. See and suffer from the adverse impacts of climate change, including but not limited to increased intensity of tropical cyclones, sea level rise, severe storm surges, more frequent and more extreme weather events, coral bleaching, saltwater intrusions, higher king tides, coastal erosion, changing precipitation patterns, submersion of islands, and ocean acidification with scientific evidence clearly informing us that these impacts will further intensify over time. So the Pacific leaders are quite clear that this is what we're facing. And I'm particularly enamored of the Suva Declaration because I helped write it, and so did my students. <laughs> And these are some of those students that helped write it. So as we went into Paris, we weren't sure what was going to unfold. We thought we might have another Copenhagen and things might fall apart. But we had some incredible leadership in the Pacific. So we had a team of about 20 students from the University of the Pacific, South Pacific, helping to support the leadership in the Paris negotiations. And at the end of the first week, many countries had begun to block inclusion of science in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and in the Paris Agreement. But in the second week, we had incredible Pacific leadership emerge. We had Tony de Broom step up with the High Ambition Coalition that included the US and Europe. And so they clearly were able to say, we need to have higher ambition to reduce emissions. Because we need to address these issues with regard to climate change. We need to be able to preserve the future of our countries. We need to make sure that Kiribati that Tuvalu and that the Marshall Islands have a future and that we don't need to worry about what happens to those cultures or to our UN vote as those countries become submerged. So when Tony de Broom stepped up, backed by the US and the EU, they needed to begin, they needed momentum 
and they needed the other countries to come in behind them to back that agreement. So in the things that happened behind the scenes, these students and I were able to have some influence because the EU came to us and said, well, we have this Cotonou Agreement and we have the Africa-Caribbean Pacific Alliance that number 79 countries, how do we make sure that they're having agreed to all of the elements of the Suva Declaration, including a commitment to 1.5 degrees, including legally binding, including loss and damage, and a commitment to transparency? How do we make sure that all of those are what go forward? And so the EU came to me and they said, where do we find the Pacific? Where do we find the right people in the Pacific to talk to? And I said, here, come, come. I'll take you over. So we went to the Marshall Islands booth, and we found Tony de Broom. And that's the man in the middle. And we were able to then bring 79 countries in the momentum behind the Paris Agreement. But we had a problem. We didn't have any kava. <laughs> and in my stupidity, I had failed to bring kava. And so in the Pacific, we always have to have kava, and we have to have a Talanoa to decide that that's what we've agreed upon. But luckily, I had a student. Among the 20 students that were there, one of my students was standing there, and she said, oh, I've got kava but she was from the Federated States of Micronesia. And so she went with the Fiji person back to the hotel room in the depths of where the Paris bombers in that neighborhood, that's where we were ensconced to find the kava and to bring the kava over so that we could have a bowl because in the Pacific, we need to make collective decisions. We need to have the kava that fuel the conversation, that fuel the equal partnership. So, but that kava was what brought us the 79 countries in behind, and then even Brazil, India, and China came in behind. They were not always willing, but they did, and at the end of the day, Every country but Nicaragua was comfortable with the Paris Agreement. So, and now Nicaragua has signed on. <laughs> so, they were a little bit uncomfortable that we hadn't gotten the 1.5. So, and because it was just a commitment to getting to 1.5, the true commitment was to the two degrees of warming. So. I'll just read the piece of the Paris Agreement to acknowledge Tony de Broom. And this is Tony. He's the foreign minister of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, or he was at that point. And he's now passed on. But he's one of our heroes. And Hilda Heine, the only woman president in the Pacific, has replaced him. So in his leadership role, not replaced him, in all of his roles. So, acknowledging that climate change is a common concern of humankind, parties should, when taking action to address climate change, respect, promote, and consider their respective obligations on human rights, the right to health, the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations, and the right to development, as well as gender equality, the empowerment of women in intergenerational equity. Those are really aspirational words. So in F January 2016, Fiji became the first country to ratify the Paris Agreement. In January, in February of 2016, we had Tropical Cyclone Winston visit us in Fiji. And Tropical Cyclone Winston is only one of a whole long list of tropical cyclones that have visited the Pacific. 
So we had Tropical Cyclone Evan in 2012. We had Tropical Cyclone Ian hit Hapai and Tonga in 2014. We had Tropical Cyclone Ita hit Honiara in the Solomon Islands in 2014. We had Tropical Cyclone Pam hit Vanuatu in 2015. Total fatalities, 24. Damage, 360.4 billion. It was a Category 5 tropical cyclone, the strongest we had ever seen in the Southern Hemisphere. Tropical Cyclone Winston top tropical cyclone Pam. So tropical cyclone Winston made a very circuitous path, came here, came here, went all of the way over to Tonga before coming back across the islands of Fiji. It hit Vanua Balavu at dawn and then proceeded to pile up all of the water of the Koro Sea against two islands. Excuse me, all of that water of the Koro Sea against these two islands, Vanua Levu and Viti Levu. So it arrived at dusk. And um, we had 40 meter seas. We had inundation penetrating five to 10 kilometers inland. And we had 43 people pass away. Two thirds of the population were displaced. And I know the Caribbean has had a lot happen this year, but we also have had $2 billion worth of losses from relatively small economies over the past five years in the Pacific. So when we talk about policy, we can go back to the United Nations framework 1992 agreement and Article 2 looking at dangerous anthropogenic climate change. And we can ask, are we already there in the Pacific? And what do we need to do about it? So the, what we're looking at in terms of sea level rise already is just about 20 centimeters. What's projected by the IPCC by the end of this century is about a meter. But we usually measure these things in paddle lengths because we often don't have meter sticks on our voyaging canoes. And what we're looking at with regard to projections of storm surge, like the storm surge that we had in any of those tropical cyclones, we're looking at a thousand fold increase in some parts of the Pacific for storm surge, even at the relatively conservative projections of the IPCC. And that sort of storm surge can look like this in the Marshall Islands. And similarly, devastating storm surges happen in tropical cyclone Pam, but they just weren't, they weren't just restricted to Vanuatu. They extended to Tuvalu. They extended to Kiribati. And they extended to the Solomon Islands. And more recently, for California, they've just released a report looking at two and three meters of sea level rise. And generally, when I talk about two and three meters of sea level rises, now this is, it's a low probability event, but we need to be planning for these probabilities across the Pacific. So I had my paddling team stand to display what three meters might look like because I couldn't bring all of my paddles with me. <laughs> because usually I hold my paddles up but I have trouble also having enough arms like an octopus to hold them all up. So all of this is um, 
sort of difficult and challenging news for us to deal with. But in the Pacific, we actually already do have solutions, the sort of solutions that I um, referred to earlier um, with conservation and with the Kava Bowl, because we have something called the Talanoa Facilitative Dialogue, the Talanoa Process. And the Talanoa process is actually what will inform the facilitative dialogue from the policy world at the end of this year. But we also use that process, the Kava Bowl, and the process of having participatory collective discussions to address what happens at the community level. So it doesn't just happen at the international policy level, it happens all the way down to the to the community level. So in the 15 countries that I referred to, we have a network of more than 100 communities that we've worked in with that Talanoa process, that participatory, that inclusive process that builds solidarity to look across all of these different sectors, to look at institutional resilience, to look at human skills and capability, to look at financial capacity, to look at infrastructure and service capacity, to look at natural resource capacity, to look at all of these different food security, ecosystem health, energy security, water security, income security, community health security, and security of place objectives. And in Fiji, where we've applied this to now more than 500 communities, and in thinking about what we're facing in terms of danger. More than 80% of those communities have already identified themselves as being in the dangerous zone. And the single most area of concern is their security of place. And, and that's at a high island. That's not one of the low islands like the Republic of the Marshall Islands that I showed you in the diagram. But by coming together and looking at this together, we're building resilience in those communities. So we're already doing things like installing water tanks, planting mangroves, building resilience, making sure that those communities are prepared for what may come. And one of the successes that we had this year was tremendous. Because in our training in this more than 100 communities, we were also asked by the Anglican Church to train them in disaster preparedness. And we had a year ago trained an entire youth group in Nukalofa in Tonga. And in February of this year, Tropical Cyclone Gita, as a Category 4 Tropical Cyclone, was headed to the capital of Nukalofa. And the youth were saying, what are we going to do? The church was saying, what are we going to do for their communities? And then they realized that they had been through our training. So they got together, the Anglican Church youth, and they had built maps of who the vulnerable people were in their communities. They had built maps, they had built maps of where the vulnerable buildings were using one of the tools that we had developed. And so they first prepared their families and they gave them all of they gave them matches, resources, flashlights, things like that. I know it's small. They secured their family homes. These are young people. These are 20-year-olds. They secured their family homes. They then came together to look after all of the elderly, to look after all of the vulnerable, so that no one was alone at midnight when Tropical Cyclone Gita arrived in Nukalofa, when Tropical Cyclone Gita took off the roof of the Met Service, and the Met Service had to transfer its forecasting over to Fiji. No one was alone 
when the roof blew off the parliament building. <laughs> and so all of these youth got together, and the next day, they began remapping. They began the cleanup, and they began leading their own resilience. And Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, came to visit a couple of weeks later, 10 days later. He was already planned to come to the Pacific. And he's the same archbishop who will marry Prince Henry, Harry, next week. <laughs> so he came in March, and he listened to the Tongan youth, and it was stunning. It was stunning to hear those youth step up and say, intergenerational equity, we got this. Rebuilding, we got this. This is our place. This is our future. We will work together. And we will rebuild Nukolofa. And we will support the rebuilding of our communities. And so the Archbishop of Canterbury has now decided to make it a global issue in the church. And the, we'll start with the Pacific, with the support of the Anglican Church. But that builds on what happened with Pope Francis. That builds on the Laudato Si. That builds on our legacy as voyagers in the Pacific, because this is our youth saying, we can do this. We can plant those mangroves. We can sail those ships. We can take responsibilities for our communities. And they're doing it in so many different ways. And I am so privileged to be able to work with these young people on an everyday basis. So, after Winston passed by, I learned to paddle. That's why I have those paddles. But I got Zika first, before I picked up that paddle. But I get to work with Pacific leaders and Pacific youth who see their responsibility as being stewards of our Pacific Ocean and being stewards of the future of the planet. Because as you all know, there's our Pacific right there. The whole planet revolves and depends on this ocean. And even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is no longer calling the Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere as oceans. It's calling it one ocean. So we have one ocean to look after. And that ocean was given to us by our ancestors to manage so that we could pass it on to our children and future generations. It is our common responsibility and moral obligation for our children. And that was said by one of our Pacific elders. So I want to give us plenty of time to talk and discuss, because that's so important for us in the Pacific, so that we can recognize the interconnectedness of one another and come up with our own solutions together. But before. Before I end, I want to uh, say Vanakavaka Levu from Fiji, Fafatai Telilava, Malo Alpito from Tonga, thank you, Meral Mal Sulong, Koraba, Obrigado, thank you, Tomas, thank you, Tru, Fakafatai Lasi, Kumultata, Metaki Maata, Tubawa. Fakawal lahi, nakabakilevo.
Um, so the question is, many islands are high islands and they have a place to go, but others are not. So with reference to the high island and what are the, what are the status of um, refugees and movements? So the only country right now that has said that they will accept Pacific Island residents and citizens is Fiji. And that's in keeping with its presidency of the United Nations Ocean, of the United Nations General Assembly, as well as in keeping with its presidency of COP23 right now. Um, other countries like Kiribati, Tuvalu, and the Marshall Islands have elevations that are three meters. So if this prediction that's being used for planning in California of two to three meters of sea level rise is true, it comes to re it, the prediction is true, but if it unfolds, what will, what will happen? And if it unfolds as fast as that prediction that we have two or three meters by the end of the century, that will be very destabilizing for us as countries. So the Columbia Law School, for example, has begun to take this up, as has have many others. And there's a lot of discussion about what happens both to the refugees and the New Zealand courts have taken it up. But um, those that live in the American compact territories Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and Palau have American passports. And Hawaii is already thinking about what will happen when they're flooded with more and more refugees. Because as Pacific Islanders, we tend to gravitate towards other Pacific Islanders. There's discussion about how many people have to stay on an island to have voting rights in the UN. Because at some point, one of our only ways forward is to have voting rights in the UN. What happens with cultures? In Fiji, and that's for the small islands, but for example, in Fiji, where we've already surveyed all of the, the indigenous villages, 676 villages have already identified that they need to relocate. And in Alaska, the cost of relocation for each of the villages that is already underway for relocating in Alaska is about 10 million USD. And those are for relatively small villages. Fiji doesn't have the resources to do that. We've already begun moving three <coughs> villages. And that's all very complicated because some people prefer to stay where they were. And then you have the complication of what are the decisions that aid deliverers do. We had a USAID project come in and decide that they would take the mean of the sea level rise. They didn't consult me, they didn't consult the scientists. They just said, we'll take the mean. And that's half a meter. So they built disaster relief centers only a half a meter above sea level rise with your taxpayer dollar because they didn't connect to the science. So this is, a very complicated set of issues. At the same time that we've got the drought in Syria driving migrants from the Middle East. It's not just the drought, but the drought helped destabilize the society enough to push the political revolution. And how many times is that sort of thing gonna happen? The question is, what am I excited about, in, given the depressing news that we get to deliver? <laughs>
I'm excited because I get to work with visionary people in the Pacific and visionary young people. And in a way, I'm sorry to make the jump between this and rugby, but for us in Fiji, a lot of it's about rugby. And we figure if we could win the Olympic gold medal the first time there ever was one in Brazil, in Rio, that we can lead in a lot of different ways. And you know that Olympic gold medal winning team talks about climate change too. So what gives me hope is the interconnectedness and the realization of that interconnectedness in our young people and our Pacific leaders. So that's what gives me hope, and that ocean. Um, President Anote Tong of Kiribati has been looking at all options, and he's now the former president of Kiribati. But what's been happening with the Chinese in building new islands in the for the Chinese, the Spratly Islands, is one thing that's being seriously considered. The leadership of the Marshall Islands has been discussing what islands do they sacrifice to build up other islands. There's discussions with the Japanese of how do we build floating islands. And if you have a floating island, that's tethered, is that still an island in the UN system, for example? There's lots of other territorial discussions as well as, as the EEZ calculation, the economic exclusion zone calculation, depends on distance from land area. And if you go back even to the Fiji case, you see that Fiji's economic exclusion zone extends far to the south, potentially further than you would ordinarily see because of these large islands. Well, it turns out we have a reef down here, Combs Reef. That reef gives us a lot more EEZ. What happens when that goes under? And how do we deal with this very complicated political landscape of the United Nations Law of the Sea, the International Maritime Organization, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and how do we deal with all of those pieces? So it's, there are many different ways of looking at it. And Anote Tong had a lot of emphasis on something he called migration with dignity, because he wants to make sure that his people were prepared to move with dignity, so that there's not a loss of respect. The question was raised is, what about culture? How do we? Is what we're doing in the communities um, more colonial imposition, or is it, um, is it building upon traditional practices for resilience within those communities? And it's what I, I, I've moved the slide to the boat because this is one of our traditional sailing canoes, the Utunialo. And that for us, that represents the fusion of the old and the new. So we can't, indigenous cultures, what we already know about traditional practices for dealing with extreme weather is critical. In Tropical Cyclone Pam in the first flyovers, we thought that the fatalities were tremendous. In Tropical Cyclone Pam, category five, with the highest wind speeds in the southern hemisphere, no people were lost because they relied 
on their traditional measures for protecting themselves. Food security is critical. Water security is critical. Have support coming in is critical. Many times this, the Utunialo, this traditional Fijian sailing canoe, just did a relief voyage down to Kondavu for recovery from tropical cyclone Gita, that same tropical cyclone that hit Nukolofa. So it's critical that we have both the indigenous cultures as well as the new tools like GIS mapping that the youth used in the Anglican Church. There is a strong push by the Pacific leaders, the Pacific ambassadors, the permanent representatives to the UN to call for an a human rights advisor, a climate change security advisor to serve underneath the UN Secretary General. And so that's one of the things that's being discussed and pushed for the moment. So that some of these nitty gritty issues of what happens with a loss of state begin to be discussed for things that are outside their, their, the current understanding. But there's a beautiful volume, which is in my suitcase now, called, um, that was published by the Columbia University on our, called Our Threatened Islands. If you're interested, I can um, give you the reference because it sounds like you're very interested in it. Great question. Uh, thank you so much. That was an inspiration. Thank you.